Hey, time for another edition of Unlocked with Fox's Brock Hewitt. I'm Lance Taylor from the next round. It is on Disrupt the Media. It is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Great stocking stuff for here. The handyman, a lot of great products. You can go to manscaped.com, put in that promo code UNLOCKED. And they are going to hook you up at checkout again. Holiday season is here. You need some of these stocking stuffers. Manscaped has a variety of products. The uh, the man in your life is going to uh, love. So go to manscaped.com, put in that promo code UNLOCKED. He is Brock Heward. He is fresh from Seattle. You went out crabbing. I actually called you to tell you the wine was in on, on Friday. I'm ready to drink this stuff. I don't know if you went back and watched. Tell us first, how was the crabbing? How good was it? I saw it in the broadcast where they showed us that quick clip of it. It was so freaking cool, man. My buddy, Captain Tom, is the uh, is just a fisherman extraordinaire. I go up to Sitka, Alaska with him, I think 11 years now. And, and Lance, he runs the Outdoor Line show at the station. So like most sports stations, I'm sure down in Birmingham as well, like on Saturdays, right? There's the Outdoorsman show. And Tom, lifetime firefighter, unbelievable boatman, captain, Great fisher, uh, great businessman too. So he's got the outdoor line is the name of his show and his business. And he's got the best of the best. So, you know, it's not pulling pots like the old days. Yeah, you know, yeah. He's got a winch like uh, they do on the deadliest catch. So you're just kind of winding it. Uh, the only fear, the only fear, and it was a real fear from Allison Williams. But Nettie's allergic to shellfish. Are you kidding? <laughs> but this just tells you the guts the stones, the onions yeah. that Benetti has is like, I don't care that I'm allergic. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it out there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there for my team. And if you're doing it, I'm doing it. All for one, one for all. And we had like the biggest God wink. So Captain Tom is going through serious stuff. He's losing his wife to an awful, awful battle with yeah. cancer. And I said, Tom, we don't have to do this, my brother. Like you got, he's like, this is my lifeblood. This is what I love to do. And plus, we don't need any more salmon thrown on a stupid national broadcast. I agree. I brought that up. You pointed that out. It's lazy. You guys did it the old fashioned, the real way. Uh, I always love a good food allergy story because there's got to be a way you discover it. So for Benetti, how did he discover he was allergic to shellfish? Yeah, then it goes even a step further because I asked him that. And he said, well, actually, I did this test, this other CT test, test where they, you know, shoot you up with something to measure. And they're like, whoa, bro, you should not eat shellfish. Like, you're <laughs> you're allergic to this. Like, you do not. So he has not. And I said, well, today's the day. Let's just take a little bite of this Dungeness crab because let me tell you, you will never, ever in your lifetime taste Dungeness crab like this. Do you not even only- dip it in butter or you just go straight with Lance, it? Lance, 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 Lance. That's sacrilegious, we're, right? We're on the boat. Okay. okay, we pull up. We don't even get to all five pots because we're already to our limit with three. They're overflowing. Captain Tom, as I told you, is a master seaman. And he's got there on the dock waiting for us a huge pot, propane. It's boiling. Crabs go in. An hour earlier, those crabs were in the bottom of Puget Sound. <laughs> An hour later, they are cooked in Old Bay and other seasoning. And you pull them out hot. And literally, it was like dripping all over one uh. of my... The, the, the director's like, yeah, you get, and I'm like, I don't care. I'm just like, I don't even care. I'm just smashing Dungeness Crab. It was, it was that good. And then got to bring a ton back to the crew. We gave it to some of the Husky players and coaches. We had so much to give away. It was, it was a memory that we will all have for the rest of our lives. Really fun. Well, I want to get to the, uh, the, the passing time here in a minute, but I, I got to ask you this. So as a Pacific Northwest guy, do you have to say seafood? Like if I was going to give you the option of that, that crab or like the best filet in the world, which direction would you go? Mm. Well, uh, yeah, last night I had a great filet. So where, <laughs> where would I go? I would probably go elite seafood just because when you get it that fresh. So big brother, you're going to get to his wine. Damon has property on a place called hood hood canal. So if you think of the state of Washington, Right. And if you can picture the state geography, like you have that's called the Strait of Juan de Fuca that comes off of the Pacific Ocean and then it goes down. And so down is Puget Sound, which is where we were. And then there's also another inlet called Hood Canal, which is all salt water. And Damon's got an unbelievable place out there. And on his property, he has an oyster bed. On his property, he has butter clams. On his property, off of the uh, dock, he's got mussels. During the right seasonal times and permits, you've got Dungeness crab. You have spot shrimp. So I would say wow, one of the greatest meals of my life was out on that canal, gathering all that stuff in the morning, 
preparing it, cooking it, crab cakes, different different clam recipes, mussel recipes, shrimp. Like it was just, you know, when you're eating something that an hour earlier, it's hard to do that with a steak. Yeah. No, <laughs> maybe you can go yeah. farm to table somewhere. Someone listening maybe is like, oh no, no, I've done it. I butchered a cow. And that night I put it on the grill. Like <laughs> that's very hard to do. But salmon and seafood, and I've done it in Alaska as well, where we've caught halibut, we've caught salmon. We come in on Tom's boat. We bring it to the restaurant in the hotel, and they cook it. There's just that very, is very hard. To yeah. So is it Puget Sound, not salt water? Puget Sound is salt water. Okay, yep. okay. Yep, Puget Sound's all yeah. salt water. I, I uh, thought it was. Uh, now, Lake okay, Washington, this is where it's confusing. Lake Washington, which Husky Stadium is on, that's a lake, freshwater. And then it feeds into Lake Union, and then you go through the Ballard Locks right to the Puget Sound. So there's a... There's an area where you exchange freshwater, salt water, these Ballard locks, which are amazing to see as well. So a lot of water up there. there um, hey, man. Uh, so passing time, the, the package got to me roughly 1030, I think, okay. central time. So about 830 when you guys were getting out on the boat, because I yep. called you and I was like, it's here. Be <laughs> watching because I'm about to pop this bottle. Nothing like drinking uh, a good cab at 1030 a.m. on a Friday. But I popped it. And I got such a guilt trip because your brother was nice enough. Big bro Damon would to send me two bottles, which I've got one sitting there ready for date night steak night on Friday. I can't wait. But I popped this one and I was going to drink the entire bottle. I had 90 minutes to do it in a, in a perfect world. We were going to have three hours to do it, which is not a big deal. It's child's play. Right. <laughs> but two of our girls, our social media girl and uh, and Emily Grace, our newest employee here, who does a lot of great on camera work for us. They were like, we want some of that. That's and right. Dunaway was like, I want some of that. So I had to share a little bit. So I only had like probably half the bottle and then I shared the other half, but I am not exaggerating. And we all agreed. I mean, when you pop the cork and you can tell a good red, not only by the, the look of the body, but also that incredible smell. And then just how it just, it, it, it just centers on the palate. It is, it's right there with about that price point too. Camus, Silver Oaks, Wines I typically don't get in a special occasion I will have. Uh -huh. I'm a twenty to thirty dollar bottle because I drink too many bottles of wine, and uh, but I wish I could just indulge with with uh, passing time all the time. But passingtime.com, one of the best cabs I've mm. ever had. I thought it was fantastic. Which vintage you had? The twenty one horse seven hills. Yep. Which that one? Was did it? You, yeah, yeah. It was the horse seven hills, and I saw the review on it. And one of the guys that seemed like he knew what he was talking about. I forgot his name from Wine Magazine or something. He gave it a hundred. He was like, this is the best cab I've ever had from the state of Washington. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I told you some of the story, right? When Damon was a rookie with the Dolphins and he's drinking rum and Coke and Marino's like, what, what are you, 12? <laughs> like, what are you doing? And he's like, your state, where you're from? In fact, Damon's born, was born in Eastern Washington when my dad was a high school coach on that side of the state. He was born in Yakima, which is where Red Mountain. So he's got three different vintages. He's got Walla Walla. He's got Red Mountain and then what you had, the Horse Seven Hills. And uh, that is like right, Damon was born in Yakima. The Horse Seven Hills extend down to where my dad grew up in Prosser, Washington. So, I mean, that's a cool thing about wine. And you hear it all the time. And obviously you go to Europe and you go to Italy and you go to those places where it is generational, where it is centuries, where it goes back in time. And uh, that was what was neat for Damon. And he spent a long time pursuing it, attacking it learning the business. He didn't want to be one of these broke former players that blew everything. And he really learned it, Lance. And I give him a ton of credit. He spent, I mean, a good four or five off seasons and he didn't just go buy land and he didn't just go, he partnered with great people. He grows it in some of the best places in Eastern Washington. He's got one of the best farmers, he's got a tremendous winemaker. And uh, yeah, after we um, got to Seattle Thursday night, before we crabbed Friday, we ate at the best seafood restaurant in town. You know what Damon brought? four good bottles of wine for our crew yeah, I, I so, bet he did yeah, you know and here's the thing man i'm all over the place i like i i love a good ipa so i'm a beer guy i love a bourbon um i love tequila but if i could only have one it would be red wine and it would be mm -hmm. a great red wine and there's something about it you know one of my favorite movies is sideways and i'm sure you've probably oh, seen yeah. it oh yeah and, and virginia madsen's character she's sitting down with paul giamatti and it's kind of like their first date you know after hours they're having a bottle of wine and she's like the thing I love about wine is it's a living, breathing thing. Mm -hmm. And like, if you opened it now or you opened it in five years or you open it in five minutes, it's going to taste different. Yep. And yep. I just think wine is so fascinating. I think the backstories on it, 
Um, it's and he just, would tell you too, Lance, like where they grow their grapes, those different areas and the different winters, the different summers, the different moisture levels, like all of that affects every vintage as well. Every year is a little bit different. The oak, right. That they get and they have this, you know, the best that they can buy French oak barrels and, you know, they only use them once a year. They don't reuse them as others do. And I mean, it just, yeah, how, how you, it's, it's no different. I know we're going to transition to football here in a minute. It really is no different than the details that the elite teams do well, right? And no matter what the personnel is, injuries, new people, it's kind of like seasons and in, in weather and climate situations for those grapes. Like, yeah, you got to be able to adapt. And now, now, when we get to November, this is where, well, this is where we separate it. This is where it goes in the oak barrel from France, or it just goes in the metal jug. This is where it goes in the wine box at Costco, or this is where it goes in the passing time. And this is where we get the great separation that I know you live for. I live for these games in November and into December that we all do remember. Yeah, look, and I'm, I'm excited about this weekend. Uh, last thing I'll ask you about the wine. Is that your go-to though? Like if, if you could only have one cocktail of choice, that's a good question. I am probably more, probably more like a vodka soda, something with my wife. Okay. Cause my okay. wife is now I will say this, and this is funny too. Like their reds are unbelievable, but his Chardonnay is, and it was almost like on a whim, like, well, we've done these red wines so well, and we've got an opportunity to grow some Chardonnay. Should we do it? And they're like, yeah, let's, let's give it a shot. And it is. And that's what my crew drink a bunch of. And every one of them is like, I normally don't drink white wine. I don't even like white wine. Yeah, I'm this, not a big fan. No, but Damon Chardonnay, you know, because a lot of times they're just too fruity. They're too, I don't know what it is, but that if I'm going to drink a one of his, if it's not the big cab, his Chardonnay is really good too. Okay, well, shout out to big bro. So you'll love this. I had Auburn fans at my house on Saturday. I didn't give them volume for the Auburn-Arkansas game. I listened to you and Benetti and Allison. And well, it was kind of a big game for me. I had errors or I had Utah plus the points. Yep, um, smart play. And, and I don't know. I mean, it, it, we got there, but it just didn't feel I, I don't really know how to describe that game. Is Washington, <laughs> uh, I mean, they're undefeated. Yep. Caleb DeBoer's done a great job with this. They can close the deal. I mean, this is a massive game coming up Saturday night in Corvallis, but they're really close to that perfect season going into the Pac 12 championship game. But it it, it doesn't, doesn't feel that way. It doesn't, doesn't feel that way. Because yeah. in these games in November, and the only other time, Lance, in the history of the Washington football program where they've been 10-0, and 0, it's only the second time in their history they've been 10-0. and 0. So it was 2016, yep. I guess, with Peterson? Nope. Nope. They had lost, I think, week eight or nine to USC, to Sam Darnold. Oh, and then they okay. bounced back and rebounded and won out and got to the college football playoff amidst some – some controversy and some that thought that maybe they didn't belong. Um, nope. So it was 1991 and in 91, there was Steve Entman in 91. There was Clifford and Hoffman in 91. There was Dana Hall. Like in 91 was one of the most elite defenses playing a defense. It was not terribly familiar at that time. They were kind of like the, the 46 bears with what they were doing up front. So much bear, so much man coverage, just annihilating people. And that's what you want to see, right? That's what like you get to the stage and, and you know what, if you're, if you're betting them, you were like, okay, come on guys. You know, this is, this is what I want. I know you're leading offense and you score points, but that adage is true. Offense wins games. Defense wins championships. Offense wins a lot of games, score a lot of points. And Penix is pretty man. And, and he spins it, Lance. If you saw him in person, I'm telling you, there's not 10 people on the planet right now. Like if we were to do the, the old, like American gladiators or the old QB challenge and said, okay, take the 10 on the planet that can spin this oblong shape football thing and spin it in a way different than anybody else. Penix is on that list. Wow. I mean, his arm is, he's got 11 inch hands. So at the combine, you know, there's going to be no concern about Joe Burrow hands or Teddy Bridgewater hands or uh homeboy up in, in Kenny, Pittsburgh, Kenny Pickett. Kenny Pickett hands. They're none of those hands. These are great, big, gigantic, like NBA basketball. You ever shook an NBA basketball player's hand? Oh Yeah. Yeah, like Sean. I think he's got the biggest hands I've ever shook. Bob Baumhauer, the uh, Miami Dolphin great, former really? Alabama great. Oh my God, uh, Brock, he's got paws, and they're all banged up, just dis <laughs> like disfigured, just from like slapping helmets back in the uh, the eighties. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, his hands are gigantic. Like you, you almost embarrassed shaking a hand. Like Correct. That. Correct. You're like that is a ban you have finger your banana fingers, banana yeah. hands. Like you're just gigantic. He's got the longest fingers and the biggest hands. And then he's got these super long arms and then he just grips it and rips it. And he creates 
so much spin. Again, that's something they'll measure at the combine, and his spin rate is going to be off the charts. So they do all of that, and it's fun. And the receivers are elite, and a couple NFL linemen, and they score points. And save for the ASU game, they have scored ridiculous all but all season long. But, but, you got to play defense, and you gave up 307 first yard, first half yards to Utah. Yeah. Right, who Oregon just smoked and picked off and didn't even let breathe. You gave up 307 at home with that crowd in the first half. And then you know what? They girded their loins, man. Give them credit. Second half, 70 yards, zero points, takeaway. Should have been a pick six. Who knows? Maybe if they get that pick six. That was that right. was that was an amazing play, too. Oh my gosh. And like, you know, I mean, just live, I was like, he dropped the ball. Like yeah, that, so did I. Yes. live football. Correct. Yeah. We went to it, you know. Every Monday, I think I told you this, every Monday we go back as our crew and our producer does a great job of documenting the whole game and kind of some good critiques and thoughts for, for stats and graphics and video and on air and all of it. And Benetti was exactly, Benetti and I looked at each other in that exact moment. Benetti gave me this like, oh my God, he just dropped the ball. And our graphics and everything went, right? Pick six, touchdown, showing him like, uh-uh. And Benetti yeah. was right on it like, oh, well, hold on a second, hold on. I think he dropped that ball, and he did. And it wasn't even close. No, he was two yards out. It wasn't oh Deshaun Jackson gosh. photo finish. I what was, was his name? Away. Do you remember his name? Uh, the dude that dropped the ball? Yeah. Oh, my God. Thank God nobody will know his name. Five million people <laughs> watch that game. Yeah. And well, the what safety what the next it? play, his name is uh, Alfonso Tulu Tupulada. Tulu yeah, it's Moen, man. That, that's what hurts me. Yes, well, the good news for him is no one remembers his name. <laughs> no well, one and they won. Play. Thank yes. God. Oh. Uh, Fox's Brock Hewitt. It's unlocked right here. Disrupt the media. Make sure you like and subscribe. Give us a thumbs up. It's brought to you by mybookie.ag, where you can play everything from the NBA, players' props in the NFL, uh, college football parlays, uh, teasers. Go to mybookie.ag. Put in that promo code next round. They're going to hook you up at checkout. Uh, dumb question. I think I know the answer. Nobody's ever won a Heisman at Washington, right? Nope. Mm -mm. Yeah. Napoleon uh, Kaufman was was in the top 10. Steve Entman, yeah. I want to say, was top five or six. Like, not even getting to New York City here in any recent lifetime. So, it would be, yeah, it'd be an enormous deal. Yeah, Penix would have to shit the bed not to get there. I, yep. I personally think, and I don't know, looking at this, like, I'm like, Jaden Daniels is the best quarterback. He's got three losses. Penix has had to make much tougher throws than Bo Nix, for whatever that's worth. You know, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there that are like, Bo's, you know, Oregon's a better team. And I'm like, but Penix beat him head, you know, straight That's up. Right. And they're like, well, the next week he turned it over twice. Well, they still won the game. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just think Penix is making more difficult throws than Bo. Is that fair? Oh, that's 100% true. I mean, that's not even a, an opinion. That's a, here's here's the the facts and the data and the stats and nobody. I was just looking at some numbers, getting ready for Quinn Ewers and our game this week that, yeah, nobody makes the throws down the field. The Penix is 10 plus, 15 plus, 20 plus air yards at the efficiency he is. And yeah, I mean, Bo Nix is awesome. He's facilitating. This is no slight on him whatsoever. He's playing a point guard in a system where he's just distributing, but he's not Steph Curry. <laughs> Penix is the point guard who's distributing and he's Steph Curry making shots and throws that others don't make. So from a pro evaluation, it will be, I think we talked about this last week too, bro. Like it's, it's as amazing as this season is going to be, and it's going to be remarkable down the stretch, whatever way the plot thickens and turns and twists. I am telling you from February to April, the number of QBs talked about in this draft and where they fit and what story is going to come out about them and, you know, what dirt's going to come out about them and, and what accomplishments going to come out about them. And, you know, this Jaden Daniels, the, the, the better Lamar plays and sustains, the better for Jaden Daniels. Cause that dude yeah, is and that, I, I, off the charts. I don't know how you feel about this. We know Caleb and Drake are going to be one too. Now, JJ McCarthy didn't have to do anything this past week. I still think based on skill set, he's going to be right up there. Yep. I think Penix is going to be there. Jaden Daniels, when you start looking at Bo, he might be six or seven. And I don't know how many, teams are going to be drafted in the first round. Yeah, I think that's I think that's fair or you find a team that absolutely loves him and just believes in him and and we'll see. I mean, how he plays here down the stretch, how he plays in the Civil War, how he plays in the Pac-12 title game if they get there, how he were to play in a playoff, he were to get I mean, all of these are just the most critical data points for all of these guys. And in particular, maybe not for Caleb and for Jaden who are not going to be on that stage, but for Penix and for Nix and for JJ like these are, look at what CJ Stroud, look at what that Georgia game did for CJ Stroud. Herbie jumped on my show last week and we were talking about this and, 
and trying to find a comp because everybody always wants comps, right? Okay, who is this guy? These scouts love comps. Who does he project to be? What does he look like? And I asked Herbie, who's going to see Penix for a third time on Saturday night, like, give me a comp. And he's like, ah, I don't know. And we had Cowherd on our show, and Cowherd's like, oh, bigger Tua. He's like a Tua, but bigger. And no, he's not He's not a bigger Tua. <laughs> They're very different build, and that's only because of the left-handed thing. And I said to Herbie, I said, well, what about a left-handed C.J. Stroud? A little stronger armed, maybe not quite the body. C.J. a lot younger, a lot healthier, and and he kind of bought it. And, you know, just from a precision throwing and accuracy. And Herbie said, look at what that Georgia playoff game did for Stroud scrambling around, extending plays, playing elite defense. Does he go number two? If that like banked inventory, you know, was not there, if that, if those 60 minutes of elite, elite versus an elite, elite defense aren't there, does he still go number two? Maybe, yeah. maybe, but he sure makes those decision makers much more comfortable when you have that on tape. And we'll get to CJ Stroud. We'll get to the NFL. It's unlocked with Brock Hewitt from Fox. Uh, it is brought to you by Lanceslock.com. Jump on board. Free play every day. Uh, every play, every league, every day. Lanceslock.com. Get that free play right now. Um, so we've been waiting for the chaotic week, and it really hasn't happened. It was so close last weekend. Yeah. And I just look at the primetime window. You alluded to the fact you'll be in Ames, but let's start first in Corvallis, where Herbstreet and Fowler will be on that call. You look at Oregon State, they're as well coached as anybody in college football with Jonathan Smith, but you start to look at the resume, there's not great wins. There's been moments they dominated, including this past week. But if we're looking for a primetime upset, Washington or excuse me, Oregon State controls the Pac-12 now because they've got Washington this week and then they've got the Civil War that you talked about. And if they were to win out, you've got major chaos in the Pac-12. Yep. Yep. I don't know if they can, but based on what Vegas is telling me, Oregon State's the favorite this week against right. Washington, minus two and a half. And then on the other side of the game, you'll be at names. Iowa State getting seven and a half. Ames is a very tricky place to play. I think it was you talking about the uh, the cyclone that came through on the night <laughs> you were there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, both of them are very tricky places to play. Like both of them, if you think back, and, and Matt Campbell's had three top 10 wins since 2018. I went back and it was a TCU team, 14-7. It was a West Virginia that beat him up pretty good. It was Oklahoma State a couple years ago that was number eight in the country. So he's had three of them in his building and playing at night in that place is only going to amplify the emotion <laughs> at the folks. And it's going to be gorgeous too. I mean, it's not going to be one of these like, oh, sleet, rain, stay in my car. It's going to be like 60, sunny, gorgeous day for November in Iowa. Let's go. Let's crank it up. And Corvallis is much the same way. I mean, it, 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 a bunch of those were USC on that stage in huge moments, but playing at night. And what they've done there, Lance, over the last couple of years and why they've you know sued the conference and need some money to pay off their debt <laughs> is they renovated their stadium in an amazing way. So Husky Stadium, as you pictured it and you watched it, right? The two cantilevered stands and all that noise goes up and 70,000 goes down. And Oregon State used to have that, but just on one side. And Oregon the same way. Oregon still just has it on one side. Now Oregon State said, nah, we'll come in and, you know, we're not, we don't have 70,000, whatever it is, 50,000, but the chainsaw is going to be going and that chainsaw sound effect is going to be going up and it's going to be going down. And the emotion in that place is uh, you, you have to live in the Pacific Northwest or have spent a lifetime up there to understand the amount of hurt, pain, vitriol, anger <laughs> that, that, that on it, that Corvallis and Pullman are feeling like you just, you, you ripped away our life. Right. You left us, you know, you just you left us high and dry and you didn't care that we were left stranded out here. So the amount of vitriol and they point it right at Oregon and they point it right at Washington and say, you too, you could have. You didn't have to leave. You could have. You could have. We could have kept this thing in some capacity, but you turned your back on us and the uh, whew, it is going to be an emotional, angry angry scene in Corvallis Friday. Yeah, and with, with, with that said, do you think as well coached as they are and how physical Oregon State is that they get either this game or the Civil War? I think a better shot in this one, matchup-wise too. I mean, Oregon is so fast, and that is where some of the speed issues would come up with Oregon State. I think Washington is going to move the ball. I think they're going to move it between the 20s. Can they score touchdowns? That'll be the critical question. And something Chip Kelly said, and I know it's not his original quote, but it is so true, and it's going to, I think, be at the forefront for an Oregon State in this one. At the forefront, you know, in the Civil War, is you have to play with emotion, but not let emotion play with you. 
You've got to play with emotion. And when I tell you, Lance, like this is just different. This isn't your normal rivalry game. This isn't your normal big game. This has got a layer of it like you destroyed our lives. We don't know where we're going to be next year. We don't know if we're going to be in the Power Five conferences next year. And this is your doing. Like the wrath and the anger that comes with that. So to play with that edge, play with that emotion, but not let it play with you. Well, and, and I, I was totally confident that Jonathan Smith was going to play out his career in Corvallis. But now with really not an affiliation, um, I don't know how Oregon State can continue to be competitively paying Jonathan Smith with these other coaches out there. So you might force us to lose our coach too. That's right. That's right. Who is like beloved, who was the hometown guy, who was, the, you know, the, the no, nothing recruit that helped with Mike Riley, you know, just breathe life into that program, played against him in the mid nineties. And he was just a squirrely little sucker. Like, who is this little dude out there? And what is he doing? But he just played with fearlessness and he coaches that way and he's built his team that way. And, and from a matchup style, you know, they want to pound the ball. They want to shorten the game. They got a much better running back than Utah does. I think they got a better offensive line even in totality than Utah does. And they get it at home. And that's why Vegas is favoring them by two and a half. So it is going to take an extraordinary effort. But I'll say this, Lance, lastly, about Washington. I have never seen – that's that's too, that's too much. That's too much recency bias. Let me reframe that. <laughs> I have rarely seen a veteran team like this. Five sixth-year seniors on defense, four fifth-year seniors on defense, two fourth-year. That's their defense. They're all grown and matured. Look to the offense and a six-year quarterback, and you know a six-year lineman and multiple fifth-year linemen. And I mean, they're just they're veteran. And as Kalen DeBoer said, I don't have to motivate them. These are grown men. These are grown men that know the opportunity they're at. It's their team, and when you're around it, it really is. And we had shots of Michael Panix during the game. We didn't have the shot in halftime of Eula Foscio in the locker room, the six-year linebacker. Like, they know what's at stake. They know. They will match that emotion with a bunch of gritty, tough, grizzled vets that have been other places, that have overcome injuries from Dylan Johnson to Michael Penix to Eula Foscio to the rest of them. So they will match that emotion. I don't doubt that at all. And it is going to be a hell of a slugfest down to the wire. Okay, before we transition to the NFL, you are going to be in Ames for Texas, Iowa State. Going back last week, I thought TCU had a really good shot to beat Texas if yours didn't start. He ended up starting. He didn't look 100%. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if TCU gets that final possession, they might end up winning that game. Texas, much like Washington, kind of wobbling into this situation. Yep. And Rocco Beck is not a quarterback that's going to um, – He's not going to like scare anybody. You're not going to overwhelm playing, you. Yep. Yeah, he's playing solid football. And again, yep. this atmosphere that you mentioned, I think is going to be incredible. So do you do you if you had to go upset one or the other, Oregon State or Iowa State in this one? Hmm. That's a tough one. That is a really, really hard call. Now, Vegas says I think it's seven and a half point yeah. favorites in Texas. Seven and a half point favorites to yep. two and a half point dogs. But that's right. I don't think people are really factoring in Jonathan Brooks. I, I think that loss is that's gigantic. a huge loss. It's a huge loss. Quinn is still not a hundred percent. Three of the last four weeks as those games dwindled down to one score, they were up twenty. I mean, Texas was in control of those games and then just didn't didn't quite finish. You know, I saw Texas in the opener, Lance, and I think I told you off the hoof. They're the prettiest, best-looking team we've seen this year. And we've not seen Georgia. Georgia would probably be prettier. Bama, probably right there with them, but not many others. And certainly even Michigan, Ohio State that we saw in person didn't look like Texas. I mean, Texas goes eight deep on their D-line. Texas has got 6'3", 250-pound linebackers. Like, they got a 6'3", corner. Like, they are pretty. And their O-line is super, super talented. So, yeah, I, I would probably just – it's early. I'm still watching a lot of tape, and it is really about Iowa State. Can a freshman running back, can a first-year starting quarterback, can they just let it – they're, they're going to have to be more aggressive than they've been. I think that's the narrative. Like, okay, you played your ball, you've gotten to a bowl game, and now are you playing with house money? Now we're going to cut it loose? Now we're going to let it go? Now we're going to be aggressive? Now we're going to steal a possession? Now we're going to put the pressure on Texas? And who, by the way, has lost to Iowa State three of the last four years. Matt Campbell's beaten them the last two years, head-to-head -head with Steve Sarkeesian. So, yeah, right now I would probably point and lean, honestly, to the Cyclones in their building a little more 
than I would necessarily for Oregon State with a DJ Uyunglele, who on this big stage has tightened up a moment or two. So fascinating, fascinating storylines, as we said at the start of the show. So as we go to the NFL, you know what always comes back to my Rams. But when they traded for Matt Stafford, <laughs> I was like, hey, look, I know we're all in on this guy. It's Super Bowl or bust. And they end up going out and they win a Super Bowl. Um, the Bills didn't do anything like that. They drafted their quarterback in Josh Allen. Yeah. They put this talent together. Now they traded for Stephon D uh, Diggs. But it seems like now sitting at 5-5, five and five, coming off a bad Monday night loss to Denver, mm. that – this window is like closing and they panic. They fired Ken Dorsey. And I know the offense yeah. hasn't been great, but you know, if, if it's not 12 men on the field to end the uh, game on a missed field goal by Ryan Lutz, I don't think Ken Dorsey loses his job. So, yeah. you know, it seems like a panic situation. I don't know if it's Sean McDermott panicking, um, but this organization is a little off right now. And mm -hmm. do you think Buffalo has missed their window? I don't think anytime you got a, a foundational generational quarterback and, and Josh has shown that I mean, he's shown that he's taken him right to the precipice. And if it weren't for a crazy squib quick kick and Mahomesy and magic, you know, they, they take that next step and, and get to a Super Bowl. But I uh, pressing is the right word. They're totally pressing. And the head coach pressed in the offseason and said, Leslie Frazier, you're out. I'm taking the reins back. And if I'm in a in a winner or get fired mode, which is just the nature of the NFL head coaching job, like unless you're Andy Reid, unless you're Pete Carroll, like you gotta and who have won Super Bowls and have a little more patience, and I've not been to a Super Bowl, like okay, I gotta win now. I'm gonna take over the defense, and I, to me, that's what this move equally was: the firing of Ken Dorsey. Like okay, do or die time, and you know what? It's not working. And maybe they're too friendly and maybe Ken can't ride them enough or maybe he's too hard on them or maybe they're brotherly or whatever it is. I need a new dynamic here over the final seven games to try to salvage this thing and salvage Josh Allen. So I'm not going to say the window's totally closed. I think that GM's pretty darn good. I think they've drafted a lot of young people that have, have developed and become pretty darn good players. Um, this is about Josh just, hey, man, settle down. And when you try to do more, and I'm, I know that feeling, whether it's in radio, <laughs> in a television booth, it's a quarterback, is a is a on the on the third tee at the par five, like you try to do more, you try to squeeze tighter, you try to swing harder, you try to sound smarter, you try to just do less. Less is more. Less is more. And I think that firing of Dorsey will probably be an indicator, and it will go one or two ways, Lance. Either they're going to salvage it and, you know, find a little magic and he's going to do a little less and here we go, or it's going to go the other way and there'll probably be a new staff in place in Buffalo. It is Unlocked with Fox's Brock Hewitt. I'm Lance Taylor. So on Disrupt the Media. Like, subscribe, give us a thumbs up. It is always brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Go to manscaped.com, put in that promo code UNLOCKED. They're going to hook you up with the checkout bonus. Perfect stocking stuffer this holiday season. Manscaped.com, put in the bonus code, the promo code UNLOCKED. So for, for a casual football fan, they're like, damn, Cincinnati lost at home to Houston. But for people that have been watching football, D'Amico Rhines and C.J. Mm -hmm. Stroud, I mean, this is an incredible story. I think right now your coach of the year might be D'Amico Rhines. Yep. You're in the MVP conversation. I know you turned it over three times last week, but he's only got, I think, four turnovers on the season. C.J. Stroud has been incredible. There's no yep. moment that seems too big. Yep. Um, it almost, if you're an Ohio State fan, you want to kick Ryan Day in the ass and say, why on that final possession did you get mm -hmm. so conservative against Georgia when C.J. Mm -hmm. Stroud was the reason we were in that situation? I yep. can't believe the kid's playing at this level right now, but yep. he has been outstanding. Yeah, me too. Now, he does have a little more help around him than a Bryce Young has. Obviously, Richardson lost to the shoulder injury, so he is standing head and shoulders above all of the rest. Will Levis, you saw, I think, come back down to earth last week, and he's going to have a, a bumper your ride. But D'Amico Ryans is awesome. I mean, he's, he is awesome. What he did in San Francisco is real. You've seen the struggles in his absence. I know some of that was injury-related as well, but that that is just uh, – that's one of those young guys that you can just feel it. Your eyes see it. You don't even have to be around it, Lance. You're like, yep, that crew believes in them. And then you got a young quarterback that has engendered that same kind of trust. Like, yep, yep, you just watch. Just watch the body language. Body language tells you a lot, both of that quarterback, and then just watch them in the huddle. Watch them break the huddle. Watch those eyes looking at them. Right? All of those tell, tells like, yep, this dude, you know, however you want to quantify, and everybody does it differently with the it factor. The it factor for me is do guys follow you and how quickly do they follow you? And that offense is certainly, and that team is certainly following their rookie quarterback. Well, I tell you, you and I get lucky having NFC teams because that damn AFC, 
Oof. You know, we, we start with window closing on Buffalo, but you look around and with a healthy two, a Miami can beat anybody. Yep. Um, you know, the Bengals with Burrow, um, you know, Lamar, if, if Nick, yeah, Lamar yeah, and, Kansas yeah. City, <laughs> Jacksonville, um, you know, uh, back to Houston. I mean, just the future of this conference over the next three or four years is going to be insane. Yeah, the lifeblood of the quarterbacks is right now so heavy in that AFC. Right. And we'll see if Aaron Rodgers is that. Can he possibly come back? I mean, really? Robert hey. Sala said, uh, hey, if he says he's coming back, he's coming back. I mean, I find it hard to believe. And this is a point we've made on the next round. The offensive line is so bad. Yes. You know, Aaron Rodgers has always been a good athlete that can uh, can avoid, can elude, yep. can yep. extend plays. Uh, you find it hard to believe if he can, can come back, he's going to yep. be even 85% with the yep. wheels. And that offensive line, he's going to end up getting killed. Yeah, he's played behind good old lines. Bakhtiari and crew, and he's he always had good offensive lines there, and they built it that way in Green Bay. Point being, outside of him, it's almost all young guns and lifeblood of the QB position in the AFC for the next five, ten years as you rattle through those names. The NFC, very different story. <laughs> the, the NFC, who, who are the young ones that you're like, yep, Jalen Hurts, yep, young yeah. dude. The, the guy leading the league, by the way, in QBR and efficiency rating is still that Brock dude out in San Francisco that everybody still not, thinks is too still small don't believe and can't play. But you know what's coming. The Drake Mays, the Caleb Williams, the J.J. McCarthy's, the Michael Penix, the Bo Nix, the Jaden Daniels. Like this next wave, they're going to land in the NFC. And it's just going to be the cyclical nature of it. The AFC is kind of locked and loaded. And here come the young guns from the NFC. So it's the beauty of the NFL, man. It turns over so fast. Things change in, 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 in a hurry. And the NFC, just in the next two years, Lance, when we're doing this, we'll be like, man, how about these young guns in the NFC making all this noise and making it happen? Yeah. Hey, before I let you roll, uh, I was talking to our friend Tom Luganville earlier from ESPN. And I was like, Jalen Milrow, 10 touchdowns in the last two weeks. Against LSU and Kentucky, I mean, it's pretty good names in the SEC in conference play. And I was like, I, you know, there there was a day where quarterbacks were, I mean, 10 touchdowns was half a season. You probably <laughs> remember those days, right? Uh-huh. Yep. Yep. That's, uh, and then. Would you, have the rather, uh, would you have rather played in today's quarterback-friendly uh, systems? It would have been harder for me in today's system because, like, Melrose, you got to run. Like, Jaden, you got to run. Like, JJ, you got to run. Yeah, they ran it 32 straight times against Penn State, but you can do that because JJ McCarthy can run because he can hold that extra defender. And then on third and eight, we can run QB power and QB sweep and do all of that. Lance, it would be a lot harder for me. I mean, Penix is not doing it. Out of all of these guys, you know, Drake May can run. He's athletic enough, certainly at his size. But it would have been a lot harder for me to play in this era in that regard. Now, the NFL, a little bit easier. You know, those hits that I took, those are kind of penalties today. And <laughs> John some Mobley, the, some shout of the, out. Some of the speed and spacing and some of the stuff, you know, throwing it a little bit easier in this day and age and just throwing square ins and comebacks and everything that we did back in our day at the NFL level. So kind of give and take. If I could have survived somehow, some way, and gotten to the NFL, maybe been a little bit easier. But who is Jalen Milrow? Speaking of comps, who is, you know, yeah. you guys watch them closely. You you follow it, you know, day and night. Who is he? I'm trying to figure out, like. He's a he better, uh, a better, I don't know. I mean, Jalen Hurts is an easy go-to, but I think he throws a better ball than Hurts, which is crazy. I don't know if the intermediate, if, if he's as accurate, but, you know, Hurts wasn't mm -hmm. until his final year at, at Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. so yeah, I don't know, I mean, but I'll say this, Milrow. From where he was in September against Texas to where he is right now, he's a completely different quarterback. Yes. Yep. And and kudos to Tommy Reese, the whole staff, to build it around him. He truly looks like, when I just watch him from afar and watch their games, he looks like, like an elite Alabama running back. Like if he if he were just a running back, he'd be in line yep. with all like a Mark Ingram, all those guys, like an elite running back. And then yet he throws a beautiful deep ball. I mean, he just throws it just just gorgeous. Like not Oh, that's a running back throw. No, 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 no. That's a quarterback that throwing a deep ball as pretty as anybody. And then, you know what? He looks like just a SEC elite running back. There's just – Tebow was so much bigger. Even Hurts to me was like thicker and he was more power. This dude is just – he is elusive and he's playing with great confidence. And Tommy Reese deserves a whole lot of credit after a lot of hate and a lot of blame early in the season. Do you remember the date when you took the hardest hit in your history, which was John Mobley? Former linebacker. 
So it would have been in 2000. It would have been probably November of 2000. Okay. Yeah, like if, 23 if, years ago. If he hits somebody like that, like out in the wild, like at a mall, blindsides, oh. does it kill him? Oh. Well, <laughs> does it kill him? I, I don't know if it kills him, but I know that in the Seattle Seahawks game against the Commander Sunday, the little skinny first round corner for Washington hits Lockett and hits him in the head. And, you know, Lockett pops up. And not only is it a penalty, that dude is disqualified. New York City called in. Wasn't called that way on the field. This personal foul. And then it's like, oh, what's that? Eject him? Oh, I guess we got to eject him. Like, it's just some of this stuff is a, a little much. Um, hey, it's great stuff much. as always. Safe travels to Ames. I know there's not an easy way to get there. But uh, we'll be yeah, looking thankfully, forward Denver to Des Moines, Denver to Des Moines, and we'll hang out in Des Moines. And then, by the way, next week, we'll have to figure this out, Lance, because next week, bro, Civil War Friday night, Apple Cup Saturday. Good for you. We're doing both of them. So yeah. it's a 530 kick in Eugene. <laughs> and well, it's kind of sad. It's the last time we're going to see these, too. The, and that's why I, I said to my, and I don't ever do this, really. And I said to our boss, I'm like, well, I'm just going to say it. Like usually just hey, wherever you send me, I don't care. But this one I want to do. Yeah. Like this one, I'll give my pinky toe yeah. just to be a part of it, to do the Good last you, one man. when they're in conference. So we're going to do a 530 kick in Eugene for the Civil War. Game will end at nine. We'll get in the bus. We'll drive five hours north to Seattle. We'll sleep. We'll get up for a 1 p.m. Apple Cup. I will be wired. It will be emotional. Both those games will just be super, super special to cover. So we'll probably do this. I'm going to be in Missoula next Wednesday, so I'll bring my computer with me. We'll uh, we'll do it from Missoula, and then, man, Apple Cup you, and Civil War. Some kind you of know week. we're flexible, man. Ready to talk Thanksgiving along with those great rivalry games next week. He is Fox's Brock Heward. It is unlocked. It is brought to you by our friends at mybookie.ag. Make sure at checkout, you put in that promo code uh, next round. They're going to hook you up at checkout. Nice sign-out bonus there at mybookie.ag. Safe travels. Have a great call. We'll be watching. That's Brock Heward.